please be seated.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. I would like to invite you, if you would, to join me in the book of prophecy from the prophet Isaiah. We're looking at chapter 7. If you take out your pew Bibles or your personal ones and go ahead and turn there, we're going to be looking, one uh, little correction to the bulletin, uh, we're looking at verses 10 through uh, 17. That's 10 through 17 of chapter 7. I invite you to listen now as we share God's word as we find it here today. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to uh, weary mortals, that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on your ancestral house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me now? Most holy God, we give you thanks in this, the first day of this season of Advent in anticipation, not only of the remembrance of the birth and the incarnation of yourself in our life as Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Christ. But we also anticipate, Lord God, with great expectation, the return of him into our midst and the fruition of the kingdom, which is promised through him and the good news of the gospel, which is through him, that all who trust and believe in him shall experience this renewal and transformation that comes only from your grace and to us in unmerited response. We thank you, Lord God, for the presence of your spirit in this room today. And we pray that that spirit might so guide and direct us that the words that we have just shared may be joined together with a few that follow that they may speak that one word to each of us as each has need to hear it. Grant us, Lord God, the wisdom and the clarity and the understanding and the power of your word. And so to that end, I pray that you would give me the gift of preaching and those here gathered ears to hear it and hearts to make it real. For we ask these things in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but one of my favorite movies is a movie called, uh, uh, now I forgot what the movie's called. <laughs> oh, brother, where art thou? I should have known I knew that before I came up here. Oh, brother, where art thou? Isn't that a great movie? Those of you who've seen that movie, it's a fantastic movie. George Clooney is in it, and he is hysterical. I know he's like the traditional leading man kind of guy, but he is absolutely hysterical. He's got a great sense of humor. And, and in the story, you know, there are all kinds of strange and odd things that happen to the three main characters as they're kind of rolling along in their lives. And there are lots of places in which there are, are, are really gut-like gut kind of laughter moments in the movie, you know. But one of the, thing, the scenes that really I, I fell in love with this movie right away when I saw this particular scene is when the three of them have gone to one of, their, uh, one of the uh, convicts uh, cousin's place, farm, and they, they get put up in the barn, and they're up in the top of the barn in the loft, and they're, they're talking about different kinds of things, and all of a sudden it becomes apparent to them they are surrounded in every way by all the sheriff's officers. They are just everywhere around them, and uh, the one character uh, who's just kind of a little simple, I think he's just a little simple, he, he kind of looks out the window, and he looks back at the crowd, and he goes, dang, we's in a tight spot. I love that. I was always hoping I'd have an opportunity to be able to say that in a pulpit from a sermon. <laughs> Dang, he's in a tight spot. That's a, that's, a, that's a powerful reality check on the circumstance that he found himself in. And I think in many ways, had King Ahaz 
lived in a time and a place, uh, certainly was raised in the South, he would have probably said at the point in which we are reading the scripture for this morning, dang, we's in a tough spot because they were in a tough spot. Let me see if I can give you a little background so you kind of understand the context in which uh, this prophecy was offered today. You need to understand by this point in time, when Isaiah is, is doing his prophecy, uh, the kingdoms have been long since divided into two parts. You have the northern kingdom called Israel, which is up in the north, and you have the kingdom of Judah, which is down in the south. And Judah had the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, they were down there, and the rest of the ten tribes were up in the north. And by this point in time, the northern kingdom had all but been assimilated by all the many powers that had come and kind of tramped through that land up there. They, they just, you know, people call them the law, ten lost tribes of Israel. They weren't lost, they were assimilated. They were literally drawn in and became part of the culture so that continued to go through and captivate and own and control them uh, for many, many years up there in that area. And in the south, Judah was just kind of hanging on. They were, they were sort of faithful, but they weren't really completely faithful at all. And they were just dragging along a little bit down there. And King Ahaz was the king of Judah. Now, he was an interesting character because he had some potential, I think. But he was the kind of guy who, when, when push came to shove, whenever he found himself in one of those troublesome spots, he always turned to his own self-understanding, his own sense of power, his own confidence in himself, and then make decisions accordingly. And so it's in the context of that that this prophecy that we read just a few moments ago comes into being. He is in a situation in which the, uh, the remnants, if you will, of the kingdom of Israel to the north has decided to uh, uh, get together with the uh, Arameans and kind of create a military coalition. And the purpose of the military coalition was so they could go down south into Judah and they could capture the land that was there and take control of it. And so I think Israel's uh, standpoint was they wanted to be able to reintegrate uh, everything and basically get back to Jerusalem, get a hold of that, control that area down there in the south. And the uh, Arameans, they, all they cared about was just power. So they made a deal because it was convenient to them so that they could expand their little network, their tiny little uh, uh, nation and their kingdom, right? So in the middle of this, uh, King Ahaz, he's, he's, he's in a spot. He realizes he's in a spot. His people aren't doing particularly well. Things have been tough since the division of the two kingdoms. They have fallen away from God. They haven't paid attention to him, and they've suffered the experience of what that means. When you turn your back on God, God has a tendency to kind of keep an eye on you, but turn his back on you as well. And so there's this kind of uh, 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 a distance that God puts between himself and them and they are suffering the experience of that and it's a tough situation to be in. And so King Ahaz has an opportunity. Isaiah comes to him and says, look, you know, God has a prophecy for you. He has a promise for you. He's telling you that he will give you a sign. He will show you a sign that will demonstrate to you, if you trust him, that he will not abandon you in this difficult situation. He will enable you, in other words, to overcome the problem and be able to go forward because he will not abandon you if you do not abandon him. It's a great promise to hear. It's a wonderful, truthful promise that not only exists in Ahaz's day but, or the days before it, but every day since then, including in our own day. If you are faithful and you trust God, God will not let you go. It's as simple as that. It's a very basic message throughout all of holy writ. There is one true God, and that one true God is the God who created everything from the beginning. Every bug, bird, and bee that ever made was ever made was made by him. And he promises that if you trust in him, he will be there with you. Now, does that mean that everything will be easy in your life? No. Because the reality is, and especially if you really think about it and take it seriously, when you follow Jesus Christ, he leads us into paths that often leads us some suffering. It's not easy to follow Jesus. If it was easy, everybody would do it, right? If the way that he promised that we had to walk was a wide boulevard with you know, gold bricks that were soft like wearing Rockport shoes or something, that, you know, spongy bottoms or whatever, everybody would get on that road and start walking. But he promises us that when we follow him, we're going to be following him where he goes, and where he goes is in a, often like a goat path or you know, a very difficult path to walk. And he goes into hard places, difficult spaces, and faces the people who are in circumstances that are difficult for the rest of us to want to be in. And so if we go there, there's going to be sacrifice expected. If you trust God, you're going to have to give something up. 
to let go of your life in order to get it back more abundantly. This is the promise in the New Testament. This is the gospel promise that Jesus offers his disciples. Well, the same thing exists back then. And the promise is, you trust God, God will not abandon you. And every time the people of Israel trusted God, they flourished. And every time they turned their back on God, they got their heads whacked. They found themselves in these tight spaces. And this is exactly what has ultimately happened with King Ahaz and the kingdom of Judah. So now he has this opportunity. A sign has been promised. The sign is, of course, one that we read at this point in time in the, in the season because it reminds us of the reality of the fruition of that sign, not in Ahaz's day, but in the day of Jesus, when Jesus was incarnate in the world. This is what the promise is. This is why we read that Old Testament text. It connects it up, and we start to see it. But and I don't know exactly how this would have worked, but the, but the implication was that if Ahaz had made a different choice, who knows, maybe the incarnation of Christ would have been in his time frame and things would have been different from that point forward. But what we do know is that Ahaz had a choice and he decides that he is going to do what he usually does in every situation like this. Instead of turning to the Lord, he turns inward to himself. He starts thinking about, well, you know, God's got a plan and that's really nice. <coughs> but I'm a wise king, and I'm a real smart dude, and I can come up with my own ideas. And so he decides that he's going to make a deal with the Assyrians. Now, the Assyrians are kind of the type of people you wouldn't want to make a deal with if you were, unless you were stupid, okay? Because the implication of making a deal with the Assyrians is that slowly over time, they're going to certainly go in there and help protect you. They're going to keep uh, the, the small little uh, kind of remnant kingdom of Israel <clears throat> and the uh, Arameans from joining together and being able to come down and take your land. But in the meantime, you're going to be paying so much tribute, so much, in other words, taxes uh, to the Assyrians that your land is going to get stripped of all of its wealth. And it really wasn't all that wealthy at that point in time anyway. So he, uh, not only that is going to happen, but here's the other thing that's going to happen. In many ways, I think this is even worse. In fact, I think it's absolutely worse. If you make a deal with these folks, slowly but surely, what's going to happen is they're going to start casting their values into your communities, and eventually you're going to start absorbing their values and eventually forget your own. And obviously the chief number one value was to have your faith and trust in the one true God, not all of these little demi-fake gods, that, false gods that the Assyrians believed in. And the power of that choice should have been obvious to Ahaz, but he thought he was wiser than everybody else. He thought he was smarter than everybody else. He thought he was making a great deal. Well, guess what? He didn't listen to Isaiah. He rejected the promise, the sign that had been put before him. He rejected that, and instead he made the deal with the Assyrians, and slowly but surely, just as predicted, the nation began to get poorer and poorer and poorer, and have less and less influence, and began to be more and more controlled by the Assyrians, and then slowly but surely, uh, the people began to, in droves, forget about God and start worshiping all these false gods that were brought in by the Assyrian people. And the nation struggled and suffered. It was an absolutely horrible situation. In fact, a postscript of it in, in uh, uh, Second Chronicles said this about Ahaz. He said, they were, that's this deal that he made, they were his downfall and the downfall of all Israel, meaning the people Israel, not the nation to the north Israel, but all the people Israel. That's how he had his last word written in his obituary. They're going to be writing a lot of things about uh, the late uh, President Bush, who died this past week, and, and you, you'll see lots of wonderful things about him and all of the good stuff. Uh, I guarantee you they're not going to write something like that about the man. Nothing like that at all. But that's a horrible thing to have written about you. Now, I tell you all this because I think in many ways, we all, each of us, though we don't control kingdoms, at least I don't know any of you who controls a kingdom. Anybody who does, by the way, should mention that periodically, right? Okay, no, none of us <coughs> control a kingdom. We're not powerful governmental leaders. We don't, we don't direct the lives of countless other people. And yet we find ourselves from time to time facing troubles and, and tough spots again and again. It may be 
uh, uh, money may be an issue for some people. It may be jobs. It may be for if you're a kid and going to school, maybe just studies and, uh, and fear of what your grades are going to be. Or maybe even more importantly, the tight spot is worrying about what your parents are going to say when they find out what your grades are, right? That's even more dangerous than the other. It may be because uh, you're, you're struggling in relationships that need to be fixed. You're, Maybe you're uncertain about what the future will bring. Maybe you're worried about the politics in our nation. Maybe you're concerned about the uh, environment or you're concerned about a whole host of things that are going on around you and you feel like you're stuck in a tight spot. And certainly we have obligations ourselves to work through those problems to the best of our ability. Nowhere in Holy Writ does it say that you shouldn't do your work too. But what it says is you turn your eyes and your attention to God and you will see there in him a sign of hope no matter what circumstance you face. When you're in the most dire and horrid circumstance and you're uncertain about what the future will be, he will give you a sign if you look for it. And he will remind you that he's in charge ultimately of the world in which we live and that he can intervene on your behalf. And it may not be the way you'd like it to be, but it'll be the way you need it to be. And that's what matters most. I can only share from personal experience, you know, when I was diagnosed the second time or however many times I've been diagnosed with things, and I, I looked into that situation and, and man, it just did not look good. As you well know, it was not a good situation. It was basically a death sentence. And I said to myself, you know, there, there are two things I can do. I can fight, which is one thing I can do, and I can hope and pray that the doctors and nurses and others will come up with new medicines to help with that. But I also had to say the likelihood was at the time that I that was diagnosed that this was not going to work itself out that way, that ultimately there probably wasn't going to be some magic bullet that you could, you know, uh, have or some special pill that was going to take care of all the problems. And so what I had to put my faith in was the fact that the life that I had, no matter how long or short it was, was a blessing from God. And then I need to live that life as faithfully as I could for as long as I could until he took me home, no matter what the circumstance might be. And so I looked for a sign of that, and I felt the sign of God's presence in all of you in the responses that you gave. And I saw in the faces of the response that you had in prayer and in love and in affection that demonstrated you know, that God was alive and real and present in you. And that helped pull me through. Now, it happened to work out okay for me. So far, I'm doing really well, and that's great. It doesn't always work that way for everybody. But it does mean that in the midst of that, when you're in that tight spot, you aren't alone in it. That there's hope in every circumstance and situation that you can trust and believe in. And it demonstrates it. And I'm standing here as living proof of the reality of that exact thing. And I hope you sense that too in your own life, in your own circumstance. You know, one of the greatest things to remember is that God is with us always. Not only is he good all the time, he's with us all the time. And I remember reading a, a book uh, many years ago by a guy by the name of James Deloach. He was the associate pastor of the First Baptist Church in Houston, Texas, and he wrote a book. He describes in one of the chapters an experience he had of seeing a piece of art that really transformed and changed his worldview. Now, let me tell you what it was. He says, and I need to preface this, he's no art connoisseur. He's not an expert. Some people are really great with art. They understand it. You know, they can look at something and see it and go, wow, that's really profound and that's impressive. And, the, you know, they understand all the nuances and the details of it. doesn't matter whether it's impressionist or realistic or whether it's uh, ro the romantic period or, or some of the nouveau stuff that's come along or, you know, even things like Picasso or, or uh, uh, Pollock, you know, that thing where you just stand there and throw paint from a bucket on stuff and then you go, wow, I've got art. And everybody goes, wow, let me give you a lot of money for that, right? And so uh, some people can understand it, and other people, you know, not so much. This guy doesn't understand it at all, but he saw a picture once that he thought was the greatest painting ever painted. And what it was was a dilapidated old cabin, an old mountain cabin that had burned to the ground, and there was a chimney. That was the only thing left standing in the midst of this kind of pyre. You imagine the circumstances of the people out in California who suffered the loss of their homes because of the fires that are out there. And here is this, this image of this chimney sitting there in solitude around all of this kind of charred and burned up building that's there. And there's a little boy who is crying. And standing next to the boy is an old man 
and it has a caption underneath the picture. Most, you know, really high quality paintings don't have captions written underneath, but this one had a caption. And this is what he said the caption said. It's the old man talking to the boy. Hush, child, he says, God ain't dead. Hush, child, God ain't dead. I have to wonder what might have happened in King Ahaz's thinking had somebody come up to him when he was in that tight spot and uncertain about what to do and just simply reminded him, hey, dude, God ain't dead. He's alive and real and dependable. And if there is no other truth that comes out of this season of Advent and Christmas for you this year, may it be that. We're not coming here to celebrate something that happened in the past. We're coming here to celebrate something that reminds us that it keeps happening every day. The incarnation of Christ is in the hearts of every person who opens themselves to him. God is real through the power of the Holy Spirit. And every day, God is trying to give you a sign of hope to remind you <laughs> that he loves you even more than anything else in the whole of the world except everybody else. And when you put your trust and your confidence in that and you make your choices based on an eye-to-eyeball relationship with the Almighty, it makes all the difference in the world. So what do you say you look for that sign? Starting today, right here, right now. And don't stop looking until you see it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a gracious gift you give us in your son Jesus Christ. What a remarkable witness he is to us of your love for us. Help us not to simply intellectualize this great gift that you gave us, but to take it viscerally into our hearts to see that sign of your presence and your love and your promise of delivery. Remind us always, Lord God, that in no matter what the tight spot may be, you will never abandon us. We may live our lives with confidence and with faithfulness. In the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen.
please be seated. The King is coming, the King is coming. Praise God, he's coming for us. Let us now celebrate his coming with our tithes and offerings. Pray with me our 